In this bonus episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about petting a polar bear, putting ghosts in baubles, blaming Sean Bean, and sitting around having an existential crisis while eating chips in our chat about 16 souls with Rosie Talbot. <laughs> everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult and sometimes other books, series, authors, voice actors, and illustrators that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. And today we're going to talk to Rosie Talbot, author of Sixteen Souls. Yes. I'm so excited she came back. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Parsnips! <laughs> is that your safe word? It is. That is my safe <laughs> word. It is. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, Claire, yes. is it time? Is it finally time? It's time. It's time. Pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew, pew. Woo. Hooray. Um, this is, I mean, kind of a surprise, not for us, but for listeners, because we didn't tell everyone ahead of time this time that we were going to be joined in this episode by author Rosie Talbot. Yay! Hello, Hello friends. Yay! Hello. Yay! We're so You're excited. Back. We're You're back. back! Yay! And, and, and it was only a little while ago, so, you know, it must have been too traumatic. Not at all. It was only a couple of weeks, and it's wonderful to see your joyful faces and hear your joyful dulcet tones. <laughs> <laughs> and none of us are dressed scarily this time, so... This, this is what Amanda actually sounds like. <laughs> yeah, I don't have big giant teeth that I'm lisping around this time. <laughs> I fully failed on the costume, so I'm very sorry. No, it's, it's okay. Fine. It's okay. You'll have plenty more opportunities. Like Wednesday, Adam says, psychopaths look, walk amongst us and look the same as us. So wise words, very wise yes. words. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Right, I'm going to delve into this. Would you rather? Because we asked on social media, would you rather be a human who can interact with ghosts or a ghost? who can interact with humans. And on Facebook, 77% opted for being a human. On Instagram, 54% said human. With 46 ghosts, that's very close. And on TikTok, 68% are going to be humans who interact with ghosts. Everyone wants to be like mouth breathers. Uh, I'm Bri shocked. I, I'm a little shocked as well, but he, he, let's get some comments to see if it'll help us with our decisions because um, I haven't decided yet. Brie on Facebook said, A ghost who can interact with humans gets up to more mischief and fun. Also, horrifying implications, but, you know, depends on the personality and unfinished business. Colin on Facebook says, I think I'd have to go with human who can interact with ghosts, thank you. As the question says, ignoring the inevitable death angle, I've got a feeling that interacting with humans as a ghost would just lead to a lot of screaming and unhelpful running about. At least being a human, I could get used to the spookenings and then get on with serious business of helping the unquiet dead resolve their unfinished business and pass. On to the sweet ever after. That and mess with people with my ghost buddies because let's face it, it's what the point in having ghost buddies is if you can't fuck with the normies. As a side note, normies tried to autocorrect to Mormons, which I think says a lot about the Apple iPhone, to be honest. I mean, I would be fine fucking with the Mormons. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Equal opportunity. The one on Facebook just says, I'm totally with Colin. Please see you both. Vincent on Facebook said, human who can interact with ghosts so I can go and punch a ghost in the face. <laughs> and there's a specific ghost in mind there, clearly. Glenn Henry Glenn. Glenn. Oh, Glenn wait, Glenn Glenn. Glenn. Yes. Does that say good snack? Oh, sometimes, sometimes you've got to slap a bitch and sometimes that bitch is dead. So. Yes. <laughs> Glim Glam Joan on Instagram said, want to be a ghost. I've got a mortal enemy to haunt and slime. Like a lot of slime, I'm talking ankle deep. I'll spend the rest of my time hanging out in Carnegie Libraries. It's good. That's a good one. At Skywolf129er 
on TikTok says, ghost with humans. I can maintain the social ability of a human that way. Human with ghosts would just make me seem insane. Look at I'm being a ghost. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> ghost. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's just be ghosts and ignore the rules. Fly through walls and shit. I'm They're only Charlie's rules to be fair. Yeah, Charlie... most of the ghosts ignore Charlie's rules. But he tries. Charlie he tries needs to anything. loosen up. Yeah. I mean he does a bit. But he does. Like, you know. He grows, he changes. He relaxes a little bit there, yeah. Bottle up does. tight boy. I do I I think I'm with you though. I think I would want to be a ghost. Not now. I'm quite happy being alive. But you know, when I'm done living, I don't think I want to be a human who sees ghosts because having written a whole book about how difficult that is, <laughs> in fact two books about how difficult <laughs> that is, I think I'd rather stay a not go seeing human but when i do depart this mortal coil i would want to be able to interact with humans because otherwise you're just lonely i mean you can chat to other ghosts and stuff but who doesn't want to be able to creep up behind people in bookshops and whisper you need them both and you know <laughs> oh, come off. you do that thing. you do that now i mean i do that now but i would just continue my good work <laughs> as a <it> ghost <laughs> You're such a sweet ghost. That now. <laughs> I, I, well, can you help me? Because I'm going to be the human who sees ghosts. Because I don't mind being that crazy person. I talk to myself all the time anyways. And then when I die, then I'll be the ghost that can interact with humans later then. Mm. I'm, you know, best of both worlds. But, you know, I might as well make some kind of cool television career out of it as well. Like, not Derek Akora, because he was, you know, RIP Derek Akora, a complete fake. I don't know if you know who Derek Cora is, Amanda. He was like one of those psychic mediums who does the, does the ghost hunting programs, but he got found out to be a complete fraud. Ah. And I did see him live once, and it was absolute rubbish. It was complete. He got nothing right. Mm. Um, and he was changing his story halfway through to fit the narrative of the person no. he's talking to. No. Complete fake. No. But I, but this means I could be like a genuine person and not do the whole psychic medium of, oh, your granny's here and she's got good messages for you. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to castles, and spooky places, and go and you know maybe if I get off team skeptic, I might be team believe at that point. Oh. <laughs> Can we be your sidekicks? Of course, yes, frightening style fi- sidekicks. You know, I will be the Michael J. Fox. You can okay. be, you know, the groovy disco guy or the sheriff, the hanging okay. judge. Sorry. Okay, I like it. I think that sounds like a really good idea. Cool. Okay, next question. Would you rather be a free ghost, a tethered ghost, or a looped ghost? Oh, you wouldn't want to be looped, would you? No. I want to be looped because it's the scariest one. Yeah, but for you. For me, it would suck. But if anybody falls into it, it would be scary. I mean, then you get friends forever. (laughs) Right? Right? <laughs> I love that your face up. You're like, yeah, right. Like, this is my friend. Come on. <laughs> Come on. They can never leave me. Mwahaha. I mean, I would Don't say ghost traps ghost to make friends. Because... <laughs> I'm going to go for free ghost because I don't see why you would want to be any other kind of ghost other than a free soul. To go wherever you like and do whatever you want. I mean, within yeah. because you're still without a body so you can't really interact with anything that isn't a seer or anybody that isn't a seer but hey you could go traveling free cinema tickets for life exactly you know you could go on the rides at disney world because do not ask me how the world building thing works where you would be able to go on a disney ride but i decided that you would because they can get into cars and when the car moves they move do we know why no we don't no we don't we don't question so i feel like if they got on a roller coaster it would just go it'd be fine they could go on the roller coaster yeah. So you just I, have like free cinema tickets, free access to theme parks. You know, you just hang out with your ghost friend. It'd be great. And you won't have to worry about anything. Like, you know, you could go to Antarctica, go and see the penguins. You don't have to worry about, you know, survival. Cold. You don't need to eat. You don't need to sleep. No. Go and pet a polar bear. Without <gasps> the fear. Could. You could pet a polar bear. You could could the polar, polar bear. bear feel it? Nah, probably not. Are polar bears seers? I don't know. Yeah. 
It depends. It depends Some of if them. they've had the double de- if, if somebody's died for them at the same time. I would love to be like, you know what? I thought about this, and in my iceberg world building, I have all the answers. But I tell you, I tell you what, the iceberg in my case is a lie. I I make up the world things that I need to tell the story. So I don't know if polar bears can see the dead. I feel like at least one of them can, but he's a bit weird. Yeah, I feel like we just need to write it in. It's canon now. But there what is one polar what bear is, who is a there's, seer. There's two polar bear cubs, okay? I'm sorry, you know, people who like polar bears and stuff. But there's two polar bear cubs, right? And polar bear daddies don't like cubs. And unfortunately, this polar bear daddy, you know, knocked them around a little bit because polar bear daddies can be jerks. And one of them, like, you know, it was a bit of a Heather Charlie kind of style, gave the life for the other to live. And now that baby polar bear grew up to be a big polar bear and is a seer polar bear. Excellent. Find that polar bear. I feel a bit sad for that polar bear though because I be- I bet that polar bear is constantly hunting seals they think are there but actually isn't there. They're just seeing ghost <sighs> seals. Oh no. But then has a seal sidekick who actually tells them who the real seals are. I'm like, yeah, that guy's a jerk. He owes me 50 quid. Get him. <laughs> we don't trust that one then. Betraying the own kind to the polar bears. <laughs> don't trust that one. Beware of orcas. You can go out for- searching for the orcas and be like, don't go on that ice shelf there's orcas underneath and they're going to try and tip it over because orcas are jerks why is everybody in the sea a jerk that polar bear's a jerk, <laughs> a a jerk. Jerks. I think otters dolphins are, are jerks otters, otters love otters love turtles sea turtles yeah no turtles are jerk it's just it's just existing they're just floating around there yeah, yeah. <laughs> swimming and away the, and it's only the daddy polar bear who's a jerk the mommy polar bears will love them really nurtures them you know supports okay. them okay until they're an adult and then goes you know you're on your nature <laughs> what i've been watching that number of documentaries <laughs> let's move on to the next question would you rather sneak into the cemetery chapel or eavesdrop in york minster york minster's huge and very echoey yeah. I, do you know, I feel like it has more escape routes, though. So I would go for eavesdropping in York Minster. Because I think it would be easier to escape from if you were caught. Whereas the cemetery chapel, there's only one way out. Mm. And also, you know, bodies, ew. I mean, there's bodies in both of them. There's, well, I've got a cemetery near where I live and there's a, a chapel in it. And I drove past it today and I was looking at it, as I always do, pondering how you break into this thing. I'm not going to. But after reading the book, I was like, there's only one entrance and one exit. And it's a little run down. I... Could I sneak into that? No, because the driveway leads straight up to it. So it's just full frontal visible mm-hmm. from the road. I mean, I think part of the thing of sneaking in is pretending like you have every right to be there. Don't act sneaky. Like, don't, like, sneak sneak. You know, <laughs> you just got to walk up to the door and not, in fact, knock on the gatehouse and be like, hey, do you guys have the key? I lost the key and I need to get in and Jim's going to be so upset with me. Can I borrow your spare key? And I'll bring it back in, like, ten minutes. And then they'll be like, oh, who are you? And you're like, Sandra, you know, Sandra from the, the holiday club thing. And I've just got to go in and do some cleaning because they're bringing that weird ghost tour around. Like, and you just, you know, make it up and then they'll give you the key and then you go snoop and then you bring it back and you're like, thanks, you guys are a lifesaver. <laughs> and it's all fun. <laughs> Sneak with confidence. I like it. Sneak like with confidence. It. That was amazing. Um, I, I am going to sneak in the cemetery chapel and I'm going to do it the wrong way because... I need to carry a crowbar with me. And I'm. Um, <clears throat> we talked about this in the live with your story, undoing a belt and putting a tool in the belt and then yeah. belting it back up. Yes. And that that almost happened here. I mean, he he carried he carried I mean, the crowbar yeah. himself. But he, but he still, carries it himself. It is not um it's not what I would call a moment. <sighs> but it made me think about that and I was like, yeah. yeah, okay, so that's what I'm doing. So that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna crowbar myself into the cemetery job. Smooth moves. Yeah. I'm gonna eavesdrop in York Minster. Mm, yeah. Yeah, eavesdrop with me. We'll take snacks. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah. 
We'll distract the gargle. Gar- it'll be easy enough. Yeah, it'll be great. There'll be a gaggle of nuns walk by or something. I don't know. I love a nun. Love a gaggle of nuns. <laughs> Actually, what is the collective noun for a nun? That's a very good question. That a is a good question. And we love collective nouns. <clears throat> and is the collective noun for a nun different than the collective noun for a monk? Yeah. It's a convent or a sisterhood. Oh, um, boring. Yeah, convent. It's boring. Yeah. yeah. And monks. Oh, or you can describe the monks or nuns interchangeably as a collective of con- uh, congreg- as a congregation. I not... thought congregations <clears throat> were like the lay folks. Yeah. They're the ones who, <clears throat> you know, gather to to meet them. An yeah. abbey of monks. An abbey of monks. I mean, that makes sense. They need yeah. a better collective noun. That's they disappointing. Do. Yeah. A creep of nuns. A fort of nuns. nuns you're make, sort, you're turning you? them all into ghosts. That's because um, every time you see nuns on TV, they always just kind of float along really creepily. They mm. do. They sort of hover. Except the really like cool ones who skip and stuff. And the ones Who's... who are in Sister Act. Yeah. There, they, there, they there, there is a convent in, my, in the city I'm in. I could go and ask them. There is a monk abbey, whatever, just down the road from me. I'll go in there and talk to them. Ask the nuns. I'll go and talk to the nuns. I'll take the, I'll take them up on that offer for the cup of tea thirty years later. Yes. yes. Good. Good. Okay. Would you rather keep a big, important, life-altering secret from your friends or your parents? does depend on the secret though doesn't it it does that's hard though because i wouldn't want to keep anything from my parents it would be very unnecessary my parents are pretty pretty ra- relaxed people they're very chill and i think if i was like yeah so i can see the dead they'd be like that's nice dear i just i mean they'd have questions but i don't think they'd be bothered and I, yeah i don't think my friends would be either but it depends it depends on the secret but i wouldn't want to have to lie to anyone really you gotta lie to someone i know Oh, I don't know. Okay, but actually, um, really what I have to decide is, are my parents going to listen to this? And therefore, can we get away with saying, sorry, mum and dad, um, but I, depending on the secret, maybe I'd hide it from you because it's fewer people, only two people, mm. instead of like all my friends. That's but then sweet. if it was a life-changing thing or that I was like bad or ashamed I was ashamed of or difficult, then I'd be more likely to want to tell my parents. So this is a hard one. I'm trying to think of the secret. And I'm th- I'm, the easiest one is to go that I can see ghosts. And like if I told my mum, she'd be like, yeah, it's on brand. <laughs> and if I told my friends, they'd probably say the same thing, actually. I'm going to say friends just because I do go ghost hunting with a couple of them fairly on the regs and it means that if I can see the ghosts and they don't know it I can mess with them mm. did you want to withhold that information so that you could play practical jokes respect yes yeah, I like yeah I'm doing it for the lols <laughs> doing it for the lols always for the lols always for the lols such a good answer I was I was thinking like more deeply about it I think than doing it for the lols like I feel like if I had a big life altering secret the people closest to me would probably know or like have figured it out. So if neither one of, you know, my parents or my friends knew, like they suck. So then I hate everyone. And I'm just going to keep secrets from everyone for the rest of my life. And then I'm going to turn into like a grizzled specter when I die and haunt everybody. And it's going to be horrible because nobody knows the truth. Well, I would counteract that though, because you do have a lot of online friends. And if we don't see you in day to day and your normal interactions, it's difficult to know what would be out of the norm and therefore would be secret. That's true. It's online friends. They might not see you in a way that allows you. They only see more of what you want them to see. Hmm. You can curate it. I'm just defending myself here, by the way. <laughs> because you don't know my life altering secret. I hate you, Claire. I'm going to haunt you now. <laughs> well, let us know if you're going to haunt us. I'll get the cat on. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Will do. Cool. 
Last question. Would you rather be caught in a death loop or a ghost bottle? I mean, they both suck, so <laughs> neither. I wonder okay. if you could be, like, rattle, rattle your own ghost bottle enough that you'd fall over and snap. Let, okay, let's think about this logically. Okay, so if you're trapped in a ghost bottle, you're essentially in a death loop. But you're in a contained death loop being manipulated by somebody who wants to like tap your essence which is extra bad so at least if you're in a regular ghost loop out there on the street you might have a seer stumble upon you with the secret knowledge of how to release you and you have the potential of becoming a tethered or free ghost whereas if you're in a bottle trap being held by an occultist you're just in trouble you're just in big big trouble and you probably aren't going to survive in any capacity too much longer so I'm going to go for death loop My only I... problem is I really want poltergeist powers. I know, that's what I was going to say. Like, I want to be a poltergeist, so shove me in a bottle. <laughs> I want to be a poltergeist. I want to be a poltergeist. <laughs> right, so the origin story is, me as a seer finds the ghost bottle, smashes it, and you get your poltergeist powers and then become a ghost buddy. Is that how we're linking in with these would you rather's together? Yes. Cool. So yeah, so essentially you only want to be in the ghost bottle if somebody is going to smash it for you so you can be free. But then you only get poltergeist powers for a limited amount of time, so you might need to be with somebody who can put you back in a different bottle mm. to recharge. Well, yes. it's fine, because if I'm a seer, then I know how, or will learn how to put you back into the bottle Yeah, I'm just charge. I'm just going to... I'm going to be, like, the small version of this huge war-ending weapon that we're creating. I'm I'll be the, the prototype. Rather than ghost bottles, could you have ghost Tupperware? Just you know, you know, you have to do a to get you in and on a night. I can just put you on a night, and then you know you're nicely kept in the the Tupperware, and then in the morning I just lift the Tupperware bottle, the, the lid up, and just set you out that way. I mean, that's. Also I mean, I love fun. how you just like yeah. If we get, we'll we'll make the container more gentle, and therefore the by logic the ghost loop inside will be way more gentle. It'll be fine, guys. Yeah, I, it's... I apologize in advance for just picking you up and shaking you like you're a pop bottle. Why? <laughs> Why would you, you do that? I, I, impulse control problems. Like, put some <laughs> glitter or something in there so when you oh, do shake yeah. me, it'll be pretty. Yeah, you'll be like a ghostly, death loop, trapped snow globe style thing. Yes. Now I need to do a short story about someone who gets like a ghost who gets put in a ghost bottle and is just upset that there's no glitter in there with them. Yeah, it's the oh, season to write this story. Yes, Rosie. it's this it's is your Christmas season. story. My Christmas story. Where's my glitter? Oh, you like baubles? Ghost ghost bottle baubles on the tree. Yes. 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 And if you write it, it will be our our Christmas live episode one, and we will do it then. <laughs> yes. All of this is true because we do love to do live episodes for Christmas so you're going to need to write us a Christmas short story Christmas really. short story about ghosts and baubles yes in a non horrendous way yes in a in a jolly sort of way maybe Leonie can work out how to do that if anybody could Leonie could do it yeah yeah I agree and then like there's a Santa involved and he's wearing some of the little specks because I mean, they. I feel like they I mean, look like course, Santa Santa's glasses. Santa so the, the Santa everything. is involved. Santa's always involved. <laughs> you get All right. around that, man. <laughs> if you've got seers, you've got magic, why can't Santa be real? And he's the one who who helps Leone. He's the one who gifts Leone a box of bo- special baubles <laughs> full of Christmas spirit. And yes. And, you know, deathly power. <laughs> That's a Christmas Spirit. spirit. <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, well we've we've got you started. Now you just pick it up and make it into something real. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Go. It's an plus Wikipedia, it doesn't have to make any sense. No, it does not. It does not have to make any sense. And then when everyone's like, Why did you write this? Fictional hangover told me to. I have to do it. False. It's their false. fault. The reason is I need to do anything. For the lols. The reason is for, for the, the lols. lols. Perfect. That's perfect. What a good ending to Would You Rather. That was great. That was... So now we have to go on and talk about other things. And like instead of asking any of these questions, I want to just keep plotting out your short story. <laughs> Sorry. Badly. 
<laughs> but like, made, yeah, make it terrible. <laughs> I just on it yesterday as well. well. I feel like I need to go, go get it. But it's downstairs. I'm not gonna. <laughs> but like, this will be fan fiction of my own stories. I've never, yes. I've never written fan fiction. I've never read any fan fiction actually either. Well, let's but fix that. We'll help you. We'll help you fix it. I don't know if I've ever read fan fiction. We do. Oh, super fan Drew. She has done both. I will go and put Christmas Yeah, right? I am. Um, I'm not. I'm not a fan of fan fiction unless I am participating in it. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like a fandom that I would love enough to want to read within it that isn't like canon stuff that the author's written. Your and, story. Like, um, which one? this one? Sixteen oh, Ghosts. Yeah. It's or Obviously, Sixteen Souls. It's really good. Oh. I mean, I don't know if anyone's written any fan fiction. If they have, I would love to know. But I also legally don't know if I'm allowed to read it. Probably not. So oh. I just have to exist out there in the ether. Hmm. If they have, but I wouldn't even know where to look for it. So Google, Google Sixteen yeah. Souls fan fiction. Yeah. That's it. It's and it's easy. just somehow this episode of Fictional Hangover is already out there. And it's on, it's on a loop. <laughs> it's in a death loop! Yes, it's fine. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm so glad it's close, close to Christmas and not Easter, because imagine having an Easter bunny would be freaking terrifying. Yeah, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's save that holiday episode for later. <laughs> okay. So I feel like I should just lean back while you two talk about York. I'll just listen. Claire, you can ask all your questions of York. And I'll just sit here. I feel really pressured now. Yeah. Well, you know, we have questions that we wrote already. So you can just read those. And she oh. knows about them too, spoiler alert, everyone. We send the questions in advance. I have scanned the questions <laughs> about 15 minutes ago. Not quite. Like half an hour ago. I went, cool question. Yes. Well, I mean, York is literally an hour and a half, if that, drive down the road for me. And I, so I'm there fa fairly on the regular. And especially, you know, every time I need to get a new ghost, a York ghost, because, you know, you've got to have an official York ghost. Okay. Ghost. Yeah. I and love I've got about. That. 20 plus of them. Oh, I need to move amazing. this one up because he matches. There's, there's, there's one. There you go. He matches I don't the know cover. How you can work. I feel like I should have a bigger collection, but getting hold of them is quite difficult because they're so in demand. And I don't, you know, being at the opposite end of the country, I can't drive down and queue for four hours and just in like a, a day. So, yeah, we queued yeah. for two, two hours last year to get into yeah. the shop and we were there nearly for opening. It was absolutely crazy. So yes, I know York, and there was one section I took a picture because I was reading the book, and I took a picture, and I literally just wrote all over it. I know all of these streets. I know where. <laughs> I know where this is. I I literally could in my head follow Charlie going from the geek shop to the shambles. I'm like, I better know which geek shop that is, um, <laughs> all the way up, and then through uh, Kingsbridge and all that. I was like, I, I know this. I know this. Don't know the cross the river. York quite a, I'm still quite in the touristy areas of central York so and I've done probably like four or five ghost, hunt, ghost tours and mm. stuff of York so I know York is super haunted I know it is so atmospheric it's like if Amanda you went to York you'd be like how old is this place and it's like, the answer is older than your country by quite a considerable amount and especially the shambles because the way everything just leans in it all leans in, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's an obvious setting. And it, you say in the book, it's an obvious setting. But what other factors drew you to York? Apart from York being absolutely gorgeous as well. I love York. I, well, so when I was thinking about where to set a ghost story, I was like, if I, ideally, where am I going to set a ghost story? And I wanted it to be a city because I wanted it to be somewhere with a very rich history that I could draw on for inspiration for different characters and things. And, you know, I thought, well, London, that's near me. I know London quite well. But every contemporary paranormal story set in London, I mean, not everyone, but you know, it's a very common yeah. setting. And and I was like, well, the South gets so much love. The capital gets so much love. 
I want to read more books set in the north of England. So why don't I set my book in the north of England instead of the south of England, which will give me an excuse to go on holidays I want to go on um, and research trips I want to go on. So, and then when I was thinking about sort of more northern cities, like York just was, it just had to be York. And I, okay, I also we're going to blame Sean Bean a little bit because <laughs> I love him and specifically like i think i saw a thing with an actor is it ray winston an actor called ray winston years yeah. ago which was like a bbc dramatization of the wives of henry the eighth and he played henry the eighth and sean bean played um a historic figure in york who fought against or well, the, the pilgrimage against um the change in the from the catholic church to the protestant church with henry the eighth at the head of the church and he kind of marched down and and in true sean bean fashion ended up having his head chopped off for trees and like classic but it just it kind of i saw that as a kid and was like wow i didn't realize that york was such an important city in british history i had no idea i i was probably like 10 or something and i was like this is so exciting and i have relatives in yorkshire and it just became like i just love york i just love york and so it was an excuse because it's one of my favorite places in the world to to set a book there oh i'm 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 to be very excessive british chuffed to bits that it is because it's so nice to actually get uh, a book where i know the city and i i mean i've been to york like i say i've been in york a few times robert askey that's what john B. yeah robert askey um and I've been to London a few times, but I don't, you know, apart from the touristy areas, I don't know it that well. And it's not, it's not a favourite city. Edinburgh and York are my favourite cities in, in the United Kingdom because, you know, I love the ghostly aspect. I love the atmosphere. It's just, it just feels different. Mm. Um, But it was actually to get a place where I've been to so often. It's just so nice. And I did actually buy 16 Souls in York. Oh, yay. And on my Instagram, I took pictures of 16 Souls in York. I took it on a tour and took it into the York Ghost Merch. And when I bought Amanda, one of the ghosts, that's on her shelf, um, I haven't taken um, 12 Bones yet because I haven't been since it was it's published. But next time I go to York, I'm actually going to take 12 Bones and take it on a tour as well because it needs to go to York. Yes, please, it does. So, it needs to go home. It needs so to be go on a book tour. Um, so, is there a York ghost story that is your favourite? Because there was one about a hamster that I quite like, but um, it's more of a silly one. And there's so many. There's so many. There are so, so, so many. And I I read so many when I was trying to decide on... Because I, I didn't want Charlie's main friends to necessarily be famous York ghosts. So the more famous your ghosts are on the periphery, because that gave me more freedom with his immediate friends. Yeah. Um, so I kind of used the stories. We've got Jeff Monroe, the Canadian M, and we have like Mad Alice. We have, and do you know what? I think Mad Alice might be one of my favorite stories yes. because it's this idea, and like every good ghost story, it's a it's a proper story. Because as far as I'm aware, somebody did try and research. So the story is that Mad Alice lived on this lane and she had a very violent husband and she essentially murdered him and then was convicted, but not of murder. She was basically executed for going insane, which is, you know, the least of the things that women were executed for or even committed to asylum is for back in the day. Sometimes women were committed to an asylum because their husband decided to leave just that. And they were like, oh, we should put them in the asylum. That'll be good for their mental health. Excessive yeah, reading. Right? was one of the ones that's reading yes. people get printed for all sorts of ridiculous things so you know i was like a feel for mad alice and that's you know and i was like was she real and if you research it seems that she wasn't real or at least mad alice could have been a complete nickname for her and she could be based on a real person but the names don't line up there was no one called alice who was executed around that time and so and i but i kind of like it that makes me love it more because it, it, she's kind of grown into something more than whatever her source material was, and it becomes a legend. Yeah, and I love, I love that, so where something takes on a life of its own and loses its direct tether to its source material, and it becomes this kind of free-floating story. 
and she's so instrumental to like the york ghost stories there's even somebody who does tours as mad alice oh that's so funny oh i've not seen that one yeah i don't know if she's still going but a few years ago she was and she did and apparently she even like broke her leg at one point and did the tours in a wheelchair like a true trooper because i tell you york is not an accessible city at all it's um, there's lots of cobblestones everywhere, Amanda. It's, it's like cobble. it's proper old. It's not. It's very pedestrianised in that respect, so it's easier that way. Um, to stop some people, but it's not an accessible city like at all. Yeah, everything's got steps up to it, or like just the cobbles everywhere, and yeah, like a lot of really old. Edinburgh's the same. Like a lot of older cities, just yeah, not not accessibility friendly. So my knees are aching thinking about it. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I need to go back to York. So, have you done the York the ghost tours? Have you seen any ghosts in York? Or I have you ever, ever seen any go- York ghosts? So, I did. When I was in York, I didn't see any ghosts, but I figured that they were just being very shy. And to be fair, I was so busy, like, writing down whether whether Charlie would be able to, like, step up easily into a space. And I was, like, looking at all the accessibility stuff <laughs> and kind of sitting down and making sure my scene descriptions of a place were like right and how does something smell or how does something... if a ghost could have been going oi 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 and i just wouldn't have noticed and um, i was so like focused on my edits and my writing i feel like uh, you could write the accessibility guide to, to york now you probably could oh well no i'd have to go back and do a lot more of a deep dive and actually in like in 12 bones charlie uses his wheelchair a lot more out and about Oh. Um, so yeah that required a bit more sort of research of being like okay well what's this pavement like and how is he going to get into here and how's he going to move here and yeah it just kind of really opened my eyes to how difficult it is for wheelchair users sometimes to just get places and how annoying that is and we really need to make the world more accessible everyone we do but like it's difficult for some places like thinking about york it is such an old city that they are listed buildings Mm -hmm. and that to make them wheelchair accessible is to like fundamentally alter the building itself even just to put a ramp in like to widen a doorway like can you always are you allowed to like yeah it's a real real challenge to make places accessible yeah i mean there's newer parts of the city that they could can and should but yeah, yeah like the shambles is never going to be wheelchair friendly yeah no that's always going to be awkward Mm-mm. top um, tip never walk down there in ice oh like when it's really really busy with tourists so busy because it's so narrow it's horrible it's horrible i think i took a picture actually and sent it to you and like amanda and a, f- and a few other people and was like i'm on the shambles look at all of the people and it's just it's vomit inducing were they queuing for the ghost merchants? Because I feel like that contributes, but... It does, because I was one of them that one yeah. time. Um, <laughs> but no, it's just in general. And yeah, no, do you know yeah. what? It really pisses me off, like, how they talk about the history and everything. Like, the proper tourists, you're like, it, but it's, it's wrong. They've got it all wrong. And I'm like, shut up! Buy a, buy a guidebook! Stop being wrong! Oh. Is that the guides? The guides, or no, just in general, people walking around just general. Oh, look you at just this. want to yell it's at regular people. I just, yeah, yeah, mainly Americans. I'm sorry. Well, they need to go on the ghost tours. I because I went, I went on one, um, but not until after I'd written the book, and I'm like, I almost had to edit the book, and I didn't. I made the decision not to, but I was like, what in the world has happened? So I went on this ghost tour, and this. We, you know, we meet at the pub and this guy shows up to do the ghost tour and he is literally the spitting image of exactly how I imagine Rawley to be. Oh, I think I've been on Rawley's ghost tour. Right? That, the, <laughs> the outfit and everything. And I was like, oh my God, like I am going to have to change his character's description and everything because it's too similar. And But it is not based off of this gentleman at all. It was just how I imagined a ghost tour guide to look because of course, and then he is the epitome of it. And I was like, oh am I going to change it? And I didn't in the end because it isn't actually based off of him. Um, mm. And I feel like if it, even if it was, the character is freaking awesome. Yes. So hopefully yeah. he wouldn't mind. Yeah. 90% um, of all your ghost tour guides look like Raleigh. Yeah. I feel like it's the look. 
So I, yeah. <laughs> I feel less guilty. Um, but Actually, yeah, saying that ninety percent of all ghost tour guides look like because even when I've been on the ones in Edinburgh and London and a few other places, they, like they all look like Rowley. <laughs> feel a bit better. There, there must be a, like an online tour guide, like a shop Outfit. where they buy the top hats, like, and the capes, and the long coats. Wear. Yeah, capes. get the coats, get the hat, get the monocle. Yes, got the, the, cane. the cane as well. I just yeah. recently went on a ghost tour here. And my tour guide was not wearing a top hat, but she did have bloody eyes, which Ooh. I thought was, it was top notch. And before the tour started, we actually talked about cosplay and fake blood recipes and stuff for a while. So it was very good. That's coming into the bit. I appreciate some of the good fake blood recipe. Yeah. 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 Because, mm-hmm. I mean, to be fair, that makes every, all of the ghost to people, guys I've ever been on really just lazy. Because they're not changing their aesthetic from everybody else. And all they're doing is popping a hat on their head and picking up a coat half the time. It's the storytelling, though. It's the way they tell those stories that I love so much. Yeah. And the kind of, yeah, and how to keep an audience engaged. But it, particularly when, so I remember asking the tour guide, like, oh, do you ever like have people jump out on your tours to kind of scare your punters? And he said, no, we're not allowed to do that anymore because like people, it, it, people who are at risk, who don't know it's going to happen could have a heart attack. Like it's too dangerous. We can't do that for insurance purposes. And I was like, oh, but then in his storytelling, he made me jump a few times, like the way he told the stories and his pauses. And then he would, it was clever. He was really clever. He made it so engaging. Yeah, I like the ones that kind of move around the group as well and get to know you, like try to get a little, know you a little bit and can judge whether or not you'll join in on the banter or they can jump out. I did go on one in Edinburgh which went into Greyfriars Kirkyard and then into the Loch Mausoleum area mm. and I've been on it twice and there's like a famous judge there who's supposed to be a poltergeist and stuff. I have been on all these things and never once seen a ghost. Um, <laughs> Skeptic. Mm. Um <laughs> and they take him inside the mausoleum and the first time I went on was with my uh, now husband and we were standing fairly front, close to the front and you could tell they were building up to a crescendo and the guy jumped out and my husband Colin nearly punched him like he literally like went to go and get him and pulled himself back on no this is part of the show and the second time I went was actually on a person a birthday party and I was dressed as um, Daphne from Scooby Doo and another friend was a banana, another one was Batgirl, and you know, we're all dressed up on this. I asked permission before we went on, can we come dressed? Because we're going out afterwards. And one of the girls who she was like a friend of a friend, she was literally shaking all the way through this ghost hunt. I thought she was gonna wet herself. So I had to tell her a million times, you are going to get jumped at. There is going to be somebody who jumps out in the mausoleum. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go straight into the mausoleum go to the very very back put our back to the walls so you're furthest away from the door as humanly possible you will hold my hand and you'll be fine it is a person not a ghost she's still shut her pants bless her the ideal punter she's the ideal punter she was but i think she would have died literally died if i hadn't told her it was going to be a jump scare at the end and we were talking to the jump the guy and he said he, he loves it because the reactions that he gets and he has been punched a few times. i bet he has yeah i've got friends who do there's a place near us that does like halloween events and mazes and stuff like scare mazes which is really fun and we go every year and it's great but i've got friends who kind of work there at halloween and it's a rite of passage to get punched in the face it just that's a rite of passage even though very much the rules are you don't touch the actors they don't touch you but the accidents happen you know somebody's really scared and they lash out in the wrong direction or they're trained to kind of scare like dart in scare you and then remove themselves very quickly but if they remove themselves if they misjudge and they remove themselves in the direction you jump in you're going to collide so that's never happened to me but I've had friends that have yeah been smacked in the face and they like go into the break room like guys I got punched in the face and everyone cheers and it's like it's um yeah but did you get punched, Amanda, when you did it last year? Because you did a haunted house thing. No, I did not get punched, but I did want to punch one of the people who was also <laughs> doing, like, that kid who followed everyone around with that foot. I wanted to punch her in the face. I think you need to give a bit more context. <laughs> was it a real foot? No, it was just a fake foot. And this kid, she, she just sat in, like, the entryway to the to the haunted house and like 
talked to people and did bad foot jokes and like she wasn't scary at all she had bad makeup and she just had a foot and then she would get up and follow the people into the next room which is where i was trying to be scary and do my job and she's just like hey you want to give my foot a high five and like holding this foot around like and was here I am in the corner. You, yeah, she was working oh, there. Okay, I was like, is this just someone who didn't have too much spare time on their hands? No, she worked there. Okay. No, she worked there. And that was what she decided she was going to do with her time in the maze. And here I am, like, full-on demon makeup in, in a room, sharing a room with a nun who's also haunted. And, like, That's she ruined funny. it. She ruined it with her foot that she just carried around. I and she was just wearing the like and punched her with it. I remember, wanted to. Sometimes, sometimes you gotta, gotta smack a bitch with you a smack foot. A bitch with a foot. I really wanted to. She ruined it for a lot of people. It was a shame. You do really well in like York dungeons or London dungeons and stuff where they they just play act all the time and cool makeup. That's what I would. I would love them. to do that. I like to be scary, not. A foot Irritating. carrier. Yes. A I think it would be fun. Carrier. I like to tell people on the tube that I'm a ghost or a time traveler. Because I'm <laughs> not dressed like that now, but when my normal everyday going out of the house clothes, which are just sort of Victorian clothing, people come up to me all the time and are like, oh, are you in something? Is this what's going on? I'm, and I just like to look at them and go, you can see me? And just go, oh. <laughs> Maybe is this why you might not, this is why you've never seen a ghost because you're pretending to be one. So an actual ghost doesn't acknowledge you in the in the appropriate way. They just think, oh, it's just another ghosty. Well, maybe I'm a seer and I don't realise it and I've spoken to ghosts loads, but I just think that they're normal, real people. Yeah. Maybe. Because for yeah. me, they would, it wouldn't be any different. And people look at me strangely because of the way I dress. So if people were looking at me strangely for talking to somebody who wasn't there, I honestly would just think it's because I've got long skirts on. It's amazing. I'm just that weirdo on the tra- on the tube who asks people that who, what the third favorite dinosaur is. Oh no, but I, that's a very important question. I like to be that creep. Oh, see, I'm the person who gives out random compliments. Oh, oh my gosh, I oh. love your socks. They're so great. And they're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that's to give nice random though. compliments. Always give out compliments. Yeah, sending out random compliments is a lovely thing to do. Coming from the girl in the, you know, black lipstick and shirt with a raccoon and a possum eating trash. It's a really good compliment. (laughs) It's an excellent shirt. It is a great shirt. They look so happy. (laughs) They're very happy. Anyway. Oh, anywho. Do you have any questions, Amanda? Um, well, I mean, we always ask ask these types of things whenever we have, you know, haunted, spooky authors on. We have to talk about your favorite, you know, ghosty books and, you know, your favorite horror movies and things like that. So what do you got? What's your favorite? So I, I was trying to think about like how many ghosty books I've read. And I realized that I started reading ghosty books after I wrote 16 Souls out of curiosity of like, oh, maybe this is a good comp, like comp title and things like that. And then quite a lot of them came out after I'd written 16 Souls. So I think the only one I read before was um, Kendara Blake's Anna Dressed in Blood. Which I is knew it. We're doing that next yes, week. Doing it. Yes. I love it. It's oh, it's such a classic, and it has all the elements I love, and it's just got like good amount of gore and great character development. And I was like, oh, I love this book. And then I also think I did read the Schwab's, you know, her middle grade ghost series. The, um, the city, of and... city of ghosts. I can't it's remember the other one. Yeah, Edinburgh. I think set in Edinburgh. Yeah. I yeah. read the first one of those because that was out while I was writing Sixteen Souls. And then I deliberately didn't read any more until after I'd finished. And I remember Cemetery Boys was announced. I think it was announced just as I was like midway through writing and I was like really excited for it. But I had to wait. I had to wait a whole year to even be able to get it in the UK from when I first heard about it and pre-ordered it to when it actually arrived. And by then I'd written 16 Souls. So I kind of read it 
with this slight terror that it it was going to have made all of my efforts pointless because it was going to be really similar and then i kind of looked at it and realized it was never going to be similar or like not so similar because it's set in the us it's written by a trans author about a trans character who comes from a completely different background and like your life is who's, who's making very different points with the book um it's got a much stronger romance so i was like this is really really different i think anyone who enjoys 16 souls will enjoy cemetery boys and vice versa but like i was like yeah no this is really different which is nice which good panic over um and yeah i loved it i love that book who, who, who was it the author who said that um you you can get a hundred people wanting to tell the same story, but or it's going to be this. It's going to be every single time. It's going to be different. Yeah, I can't remember, but that's true. I think it's true. Yeah. So, yeah, you you everybody has their own spin, and I absolutely adored Charlie and was and, and Sam, and I was just so happy to have characters that are nothing like me. <laughs> I'm oh, not a teenage. <laughs> gay boy i'm not trans um i'm you know i i I am not either of these people but freaking hell i'm invested in their story and i want to read more about them and when they finally kissed oh my god i think right oh my gosh i think we both went yes (laughs) at last the world cheers well done lads finally got there all that angst It's just like oh, I, I want to. I want to hold your yeah. hand. No, he doesn't want to hold my hand. But oh, I want to like. To hold your ah! hand. Just do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I know. I always felt like that was gonna have to. Like you can see Charlie really wanting it, but he that he was never gonna get up the courage. It had to kind of. Sam had to instigate that first. Sam ha- Sam has a lot more confidence. He does. Yeah. Than what Charlie does, and I think it's earned confidence through life experience. Um. And it's great to see that, especially in a trans character where they're not hiding their their true self. Mm-hmm. You know, Sam is living his truth, and it's it's lovely. And actually, having I mean, his dad's an asshole, so you know, whatever. But his mum obviously accepts and loves him for exactly who he is. And it's nice to finally have a character who's had these massive life changes and not an asshole parent. I mean, Mister Harrow is an asshole, okay. He is a shit stain. He's gone. Whatever, is he gone? Um, but at least you know Sam's mum is supportive, and that's that's nice to have in YA fiction. It's lovely. Yeah, to have it, I, I, that was very deliberate, and I think as well with Sam, and particularly with his dad. His dad, ha- you know, there are is- there's issues there. His dad does not always make the right decision. His dad doesn't always handle everything well, as we read about. But one thing he never does is misgender his son. No. He never deadlines yes. his son. I was and so he... worried No, when like, Charlie went what? into their house for the first time. And I was like, oh, he's going to be shitty. Oh, he's going to be shitty. And then he wasn't, except for he is constantly shitty. He is kind of For shitty, different reasons. For different reasons. And I mean, that was also very deliberate. Like, no matter how bad the parents get, or no matter how evil the bad guys and the villains get, they never, they never dead name or misgender Sam, um, and they never will. That's not my style, and I don't think. I mean, I don't think trans readers need that. I think they get no. it. And yeah, maybe I'm they're, a little bit making a point as well. Yeah, but, they're um, dealing with enough terrible exactly, stuff. Exactly, but I'm. I mean, with that doesn't mean his dad is always getting it right. Like he says, he feels like his dad's more than happy to throw money at the problem without actually sitting down and having a conversation. He's like, yeah, you'll pay for me to have treatment and, you know, transition in a way that so many kids out there don't get a chance to do either because they don't have access or it's going to take years on the NHS or they don't have supportive parents. Um, So in many ways, Sam is so lucky because he has got so many teenagers, trans teenagers, like absolutely long for which is that chance to transition but his dad fails to even sit down and go how's it going are you okay like actually have a personal conversation and i just wanted to show that again yes so you might get what something that you really really want but that doesn't mean it solves everything and it doesn't mean that that heals that family relationship and it's a complicated thing and it's you know and people are nuanced and just because harrow is a good dad in some ways doesn't mean he's doing well in many many other ways he makes a lot of bad decisions 
I'm not trying to like justify Harrow's like <laughs> emotional disconnection to Sam, but I wonder how much he had a relationship with his father and does he know any better that that's that's how he thinks the dad is emotionally disconnected from the child and it's all about business and you know making a name and reputation you know is that the background that he's from whereas obviously sam is emotionally awake and we're in a very you know aware time so i kind of want and i'm not trying to justify his father sam's father's like you know personality but i would i do wonder if that's just like how he was brought up is that you know you throw money at the problem yeah i think that's that kind exactly of right like i do think it's exactly right like he comes from this old money where keeping that money going and sustaining that and he he feels he's doing the right things he's providing for his family financially mm-hmm. it's about saving the company and making sure that his family is financially secure as if that's the only thing that a father should have to deliver rather than like the emotional support side of things which i think is a generational issue for a lot of men um and that's simplifying it way too much but yes. you know there, there are a lot of men who feel like they have to be that financial support but haven't been taught how to handle their own emotions or communicate they've been told by traditional society that in fact they can't communicate because they're men so there are emotionally incapable of doing that which is a complete lie and i want it and that's what i kind of wanted to explore a bit and so you'll notice that charlie doesn't solve he doesn't solve his problems with violence he solves his problems through human connection that reminds me of uh, one of the quotes um charlie says whoever said boys shouldn't cry can fuck right off mm. yeah and i was like yeah thank you preach yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's perfectly it and it, i mean you, you look at um charlie's dad and he is emotionally connected to Charlie. He's the person that Charlie comes out to. Yeah. And you kind of think that's complete antithesis. And it's just lovely to see that there is this dynamic. You know, these not every parent is going to reject their child. And it's nice to see that sense of hope as well. That, you know, parents love the children because they love the children. I really wanted Charlie to have a good relationship with his dad i think in ya there's so many dead parents <laughs> um, yes, God, yes. which i understand because in order for a teenager to have an adventure the parents need to be failing in some way mm-hmm. because otherwise they'd be there with like curfews and sitting down and being like okay tell me what's going on because this is a problem like you know you can't sneak out in the middle of the night and save the world if mom's kind of being like hold on you've got a nine o'clock curfew mate get home you know so I had that to contend with, but I decided it, I wanted his parents to be around and I wanted them to be trying really hard, but they have a lot going against them. They have um, this big age gap between their children. So they've got twins, younger twins to take up a lot of their time. They have a very sick relative and they're taking care of her financially and her children. Um, so they're, they're working long hours. And then, you know, Charlie's a teenager. He deserves his own freedom. He has his own life. But when he comes home with these cuts on his face and they know something's going on and they, they try to talk to him, they mm-hmm. really, really try hard to, to make that connection and he's the one pushing away. So I re- yeah, I wanted his dad to be present and to be supportive. And that doesn't mean that they are saints. They don't get everything right. They clearly are failing in certain ways because he's literally able to go out there and get kidnapped and do like wild adventure magic things um and that to be fair though if your reclusive child turned around and said i've got a friend i'm going for a sleepover you'd You'd be like get out get out of the house go 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 it doesn't always know the right thing to say, but damn, he tries. Mm. And yeah, I wanted that to come across. And that continues in 12 Bones in book two. Um, and there's some things that shake the foundations in book two. And they're not the perfect family. They don't get everything right. And there's still like growth for them to work through. But yeah, I'm I just- I'm worried like- for Aunt Chrissy. I am worried. I'm hoping the chemo works. I'm invested. Yeah. I have a- I'm worried she's going to be a ghost. Well, no spoilers from me. So, no, I can't give you no, spoilers. I'm, I'm, I'm picking it up tonight as soon as 
and people and I'm stopping. I know. Don't you hate that? You're like, I can't, I can't read the second one because then I'm going to start mixing stuff up in our discussion and then we're going to spoil stuff when we're not meaning to spoil stuff. So you can't read it. And you're like, oh, I need it's to. The worst. <laughs> it's first world problems, but it's the worst. <laughs> Nobody knows I will pay it. I know. Gosh. <laughs> it's our sacrifice. We can't read the sequels yet. But yeah, and that's what I liked about it as well. It's a typical Northern family. It's a, Charlie's family is a typical working class Northern family where you'd expect the dad to be all bullshit and like quote unquote laddish and reject Charlie for his sexuality. And it's like, no, son, I love you. And it's like, it gave, it's, it's so, it's, it's just, it was nice because, you know, being Northern, it's like, yeah, that, that's, that is true. It is highly, it's highly accurate. So I absolutely love it. I'm very invested. And I freaking love um, the twins. Those girls oh, no. are... They're, They're so, so sassy. I love them. <laughs> They're like little devious misses. They really are. <laughs> Why don't you go slash his tires? <laughs> oh, shit. That's another short story. I need their misadventures. <laughs> I, would love, I would love to write. There's so, there's so much I want to do in this world. Like So much I can play with. Because it's... Yeah, it's just a vast world full of many, many people and many, many little story ideas. And I would love to do collections of short stories and novellas and kind of... I want to do novella spin-off of Villiers and James's adventures. Yes. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Please. Please. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't necessarily be technically YA because they are adult ghosts. Like, they are adult men. Um, but they're dead. Um, so There's that, hijinks, it's fine. But, this, yeah, but, like, it would be the same world. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll get a chance to write. It feels like fan fiction of phone books, but yeah, I'd like to write those. And <gasps> as you'll as find at the end of had an of anthology of fan fiction where people just wrote about the ghosts in your story and the misadventures that they got up to before meeting Charlie. Well, it's like, so 16 Souls and 12 Bones as a duology deals with, like, they deal with big stuff. Like yeah. potential, potential city flattening, world ending, life changing, huge stuff. And I loved it. And it's so exciting to write and it's pacey and it's this mystery and it's like thick with adventure. But also I just want to write scenes of them sitting around having an existential crisis and eating chips. You know, yeah. like I just want to write the small domestic moments. Normal where... teenage stuff. Yeah, all the teenage stuff and all the kind of, actually when you're dealing with ghosts and lost souls, it's just a lot of like emotional helping people move on, helping people connect stuff, which isn't, which is, more local it's not really to do with big big magic it's just a local thing and i would love the chance to write some short stories on novellas where the boys are just helping local ghosts you know they're just yeah. kind of dealing with smaller scale stuff on the stage that i've created please so, do that you never know like maybe maybe i'll get a chance to do that please i mean do it's it. all your fault for creating such a you know in yeah. book one how such dare a vast you world full of characters that were desperate to know and i'm gonna just say we're gonna sound total fangirls here but we need more and we have to have more so you're gonna have to get on to that because yeah. we absolutely adored this book it was just so much it was yeah. just so much fun and it's highly unexpected and the barista at starbucks yesterday when i had hold of it she was like what is it tell me more and i had to you know i don't like not giving spoilery book reviews it's hard it's hard but yeah honestly you know so you, you're gonna have another reader in her I'm, i've oh, got to check in with her next you. week when she's got it because um, <laughs> i don't loan my copies out unless it's to my mum, and that's because i know where she lives uh and don't worry mum, you're getting it um <laughs> i've promised my mum she can read it as soon as we've we'll we'll finished recording uh, um so it's just yeah, you, it's your own fault for for creating such fantastic characters. So you're gonna yeah, have how to dare you? Do, do very more. rude of me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so rude. We need more. I do love them. Good. They live in my brain, so it's very noisy up here. But I I love them all dearly. I'll tell them we said hi. Yes. What was do. it like though, actually seeing Sixteen Souls on the bookshelf in the bookstore you work at? Like, there's it's just the most surreal. surreal moment. Honestly, completely surreal. Because the, I had such a weird journey to publication. I decided... So I, I wrote the book and I did a few queries, but it kind of was the beginning of COVID, which was the worst time to try and query because everybody and their grandmother was submitting a book and 50% or more of the agents were on furlough. So nobody was really picking up manuscripts at the time. It was really, you know, 
talk about the worst time to get seen. So because of that, I decided, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna self-publish. I'm not even gonna try and submit to eat any more agents. I'm just gonna take this into my own hands and I'm gonna self-publish. But if I'm gonna do that, I want to do it to the highest quality that I can. And I want to try and get it into some Waterstones because I'm a bookseller there. So I have some connections. I know how to do the paperwork to create the supply chains to make it happen. If it's financially viable, I want to do that. So I went through the whole journey and the whole process of like hiring a wonderful cover designer, Andrew Davis, who's amazing. Um, Leonie Locke was my editor. She's incredible. You know, I just did everything a publishing house would do. And then six weeks out from sort of publishing, Scholastic offered me a two book deal for 16 Souls and a sequel, which I ended up going for because you know, having been that publishing house for a year, I had no chance to write because I was too busy doing all the other stuff and I really was gagging to write. And the idea of I could suddenly have a team of incredible professionals who know exactly what they're doing was like, yes, please, that'd be lovely. So I was very prepared to see my book out in the world. I'd literally been plotting it and planning it and I knew it was guaranteed because I was going to do it myself. But to see it with the Waterstone Sprayed Edge as an exclusive edition, to like go to the factory and sign thousands of copies to like have it featured like not just have one copy on the shelf from waterstones have like a table you know just the level that waterstones that has backed me is incredible like out of this world i never imagined that that would happen and it means the world it means so much excellent excellent i'm so, so cool. glad that you had that support as well from from your employers i mean they are booksellers but they don't necessarily have to do that no, they don't. Like so... they, they don't have to do anything, and mm. they're they're so incredibly supportive, and they're they're very proud of of the, my me and my books, and I'm proud to work with them. It's I'm just I have a great time at work. It's yes. it's wonderful. Yeah, everybody needs to check out your Instagram actually, because it's so fun when you post the reels from the stock room about oh, yeah. customers. <laughs> well, what do I do on my lunch time? I film in the stock room. <laughs> Do you have a haunted waterstones, by the way? Because apparently Swansea is haunted, according to Catalyst. I've never experienced any ghostly phenomenon in our store, but we the store has been in that location for, oh, like 15, 20 years or something. And our manager, she's been with the company since before it was even waterstones. She's been there a long time. She knows the building very, very well. She's also quite superstitious. And what, so we have annual stock takes where we have to count and scan every single book in the entire shop and it takes all night and a whole team comes in to do it and like they have pizza they get it done it you know i rarely have to do it i'm not an old season person so i get to go home but um Cody, i think it was a number of years ago and the stock take had taken that a little bit longer and she lives quite far away so she looked at her clock and realized that if she went home now she would basically get home sleep for maybe half an hour and have to get up and come back in to open the shop the next day so she decided that she would try and like we have a sofa upstairs she was like oh i can just snap on the sofa and you know keep going so she uh the sofa at the time was near the horror section so she oh. said she knew it and it was dark and she um she's already quite superstitious and quite nervous and she lay down on the couch she was like, okay it's okay you can you can do it you can go to sleep and then a book fell off the horror shelf a book about <laughs> ghosts like just fell off the horror shelf nothing touched it like and she went absolutely not and she went home she drove <laughs> all the way home she didn't risk spending the night she went all the way home and came back in the morning <laughs> Bless and her. the book Amazing. was still on the floor because she isn't touching it. Yeah, so I mean, so she didn't see anything, but she also was like, why would that book fall? It, there was no reason why that book would fall. It was like very random. So she swears that the shop is haunted, but I have never experienced anything myself. I'm very kind of not jaded about ghosts, but I sort of feel like if I saw a ghost, I'd be like, oh, hi. I don't know. I don't know if I'd be actively scared. I think I'm just very practical and feel like as i am corporeal i i'm tougher i beat them i have like a one up on them so yeah. i feel come like i'm feeling the poltergeist on me. i'm like come and get me did you just come out of a bottle no come at me he's like come, come on give it your best shot you're, gonna right through. <laughs> ah, you're incorporeal <laughs> Amazing. I can imagine Ollie being a bit like that. Like, oh, he absolutely would be. But like fisticuffs. <laughs> Come on. 
<laughs> I love that when he introduced himself as a sickly waif, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holly Shuffleworth, sickly waif. Holly, sickly waif. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not contagious. Oh, is Dante based off a real pet, by the way? Dante was the name of my cousin's dog, and he was a collie. Oh. And so it just, when I was like, oh, I'd love to like have a ghost dog, that was... Dante just popped into my head and I was like oh I'll pop him in and I'll change him later or something and then he just never changed he just was Dante <laughs> Dante um, and Scritches he's 100% 15 out of 10 good doggo yes, he is such definitely. a good dog. we love him he's, and he's in, he features in 12 Bones as well of course good, good. He's, he's such a speaker. good um, we talk about this in the main episode and I did ask Amanda her thoughts but Bowler Hat in with the nun is it Jack the Ripper? And it's not specifically, but not not. It's kind of, I wanted to create a character that was based off of that kind of idea of Jack the Ripper without, you know, Jack the Ripper is, an, is a London thing, not a York thing. So I didn't want, he isn't specifically supposed to be, but he's supposed to be reminiscent of cool. Jack the Ripper. Like okay. he's supposed to feel like Jack the Ripper and feel like that scary and that vicious. Yeah. Okay. We Without got our answer, Amanda. Good. Yeah. Nice. Good. <laughs> oh. Well, is um, is there anything else that you are excited about that you can tell us? It doesn't have to be book related, but anything else going on? Because it's we've kept you longer than uh, uh, we said that we would. Sorry. That's what's exciting. Oh, oh, I'm making a new outfit and it's bright red. Ooh. I know it's going to be like a whole I mean I say Christmas outfit but at the rate I'm sewing it won't be ready for Christmas but I just I need new clothes desperately and because I hand sew my own clothes and they're all Victorian period clothing it takes a while to make stuff and I barely made anything this year because this year I wrote a whole novel I wrote 12 bones and I've just written a graphic novel called Phantom Hearts which will be available it's available for pre-order now if anybody wants to pre-order it you can but mm -hmm. it's coming out September um, next year and that is a con it does feature ghosts but it's a whole different world and it's much more like a contemporary setting that happens to have ghosts rather than being in a ghost adventure story in the way that 16 souls and 12 bones is and it's about a girl whose father is a bus driver and when the school bus he's driving crashes and kills four students she starts seeing the ghosts of the dead students and teams up with them to uncover the reason behind the crash because it looks like somebody sabotaged it in order to hide a dangerous secret. Oh, so yeah, we need like that. Mystery, contemporary. It's all about like mental health and falling in love for the first time, and yeah, like unpicking secrets. It's amazing. So because because I've written that this year as well, I have no clothes, so I'm going to be sewing my red dress, <laughs> and then I'm just going to. It's bright red. It was supposed to be a more subtle, deep sort of blood chevy red. Um, it is postbox red. It is just red. So yeah, I'm not being subtle. Oh, I'm excited oh, I want to, to see you living your best Mrs. Claus life, but I mean, yeah, I could put a little bit of a white fluff around the wrists and the collar for Christmas, I'm sure. But get Holly, them, just them make them like detachable. Oh, that's cute. Could you so make like, like, like a like a ones? yeah? You could have like a convertible dress, a little Christmas dress. That's mm -hmm. cute. I like that. Mm -hmm. And then you could have hearts for Valentine's Day. Oh, just, just swap it out. Swap it out for all the different holidays. Mm -hmm. All of the red themed holidays. Of which, I mean, I think almost all holidays can be made to be red, can they? At least with it in the kind of British calendar, British mm. Christian calendar. So Easter, maybe that's the hardest one, but, but Halloween you can wear red. Yes. And then what other holidays do we have? Christmas. We don't have that many. We don't have that many. Christmas and Halloween. Go. Oh, Halloween. That's not Halloween. Like walks is that? A th I mean, that's really dark. But I think red <laughs> would be the color of choice. Yeah, at least you stand out in the dark. Yeah, when people when people who don't know what Guy Fawkes might ask for an explanation, I just feel like apologizing for the British sensibility of being like, yeah, we still burn this guy's effigy and celebrate his death hundreds of years later, like the weird, sick people that we are. That that was King James's fault. I've watched horrible histories. They did a Guy Fawkes special, and that was King James's fault. He wanted to celebrate the fact that he survived the plot, and it's on the wrong day. It should be November fourth. 
I mean, I like that it's on the wrong day, but we've already established that I like it when things get separated from their truth <laughs> and just sort of float off. I mean, to be um, fair, it was King James he who wrote the the Witchfinder book, so you know it's... it was. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm currently reading the King's Assassin, which is a non-fiction book about the relationship between George Villiers and James the First. Oh. Because I, in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, if I am going to write these spin-off stories, I need to know George Villiers in a lot more detail and his past in a lot more detail. And though I did do quite a bit of research for him, he is a side character, so I'm like, if he's going to be a main character, I need to know everything. And the King's Assassin details the idea that Villiers actually poisoned King James, which floated around at the time, but it was very quickly dropped. But this um, author, I'm afraid I can't remember their name, argues that they think it could possibly be true, Ooh. that he did poison the king, which makes no sense because the king is literally his meal ticket. But I don't know, psychology. So I'm like, I'm invested. It's really, it's a really good nonfiction read. I'm having Ooh. the best time, but I'm learning a lot about James the first as well. And, that man had a not a lot of neuroses. Um, he yeah, he was very had a lot of PTSD, very scary childhood. So doesn't I think come surprising considering you know the period of time and right. You know, yeah, the, well, he was like, family. Crowned, he was crowned in his cradle. He was known as the cradle king because he was literally king before he was even out of his cradle. And then he was there was kidnappings and assassination plots, and his entire childhood was being like shunted around by different nobles. Very unstable, very traumatic. So an assassination plot, he saw assassins everywhere. He was very afraid. Um, he didn't like blades. He didn't like weapons. He found them quite like terrifying. Um, so yeah, I think an assassination plot like that, I think he would want to celebrate that he survived. That would be actually really important to him. So it makes a lot of sense with his psychology. Yeah. But that's why. And we still have it today. We still have Guy Fawkes, right? Yeah. Scare all pets every 5th of November. Oh, yeah. that's, that's in July for us. We... Terrify yeah. the cats and dogs and horses yeah. and pigs and chickens. Yeah. And dogs. Yes. And maybe pigs. even a goat. Maybe even a maybe. goat. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Where fantastic. can people find you? Um, do you have a newsletter? Do you have a website? Because people need to know to keep in touch and find out about all the pre-orders and niceness that comes out. Yeah, so I have a website. It's just my name, rosietalbert.co.uk. And on there, you can join my newsletter. And I am going to do a newsletter for November. Um, I've been a bit rubbish about my newsletter recently, but I'm doing one. You need prepared. clothes, Rosie. You, you I know I can. Right. need clothes. clothes. Um, I do need clothes. And um, I also have lots of free resources on there, like character artwork and maps and things, um, and book club resources if you happen to read 16 Souls for a book club. And i also am on social media as Mero child which is not a helpful username at all but i'm stuck with it now <laughs> um and i'm on instagram and tiktok the most but i do occasionally pop up on twitter slash x like i will eventually check my messages but dm me on the other platforms first <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool. i've been i've i've been messaging you on tiktok that's how we've that's how we've connected both times <laughs> dragging you on the show like hey it I is hope. a pleasure to be on the show. Yay! Thanks for having me. Well, you've got to come back for Twelve Bones and uh, Phantom Hearts. So yeah, definitely, one hundred percent. So yeah. you're stuck that'll with us now. That'll be next year, though. You've got a little bit more time than about five minutes naughty. So that'll yeah. be next year. Next year. Well, I'm really excited for you to read Twelve Bones, and please feel free to yell at me if required. It's a very emotional and it's a ride. It's a roller coaster. Okay, we'll You'll get be ready fine. for it. But Does like, Charlie get his GCSEs? That's what I need to know. If you need to message me, you can. Oh my god. We will. Have a lot of people who are messaging me and we're like, I'm on this chapter, I'm stressed. Can you tell me it's going to be okay? And I'm like, no, I can't. Um, But carry on. I only need to know if Chrissy A dies and B haunts. It's a sub question. And does he pass his GCSEs? And it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely stressed that Charlie needed to do his GCSE resets um so these are not exactly spoilers um they're not spoilers but neither of those questions are directly answered in the next book Gah. you are gonna have to hold on to your panic about them <laughs> hold on for the short stories that she's inevitably going hold to on, have to write hold on to the next I just need, there'll be like a two page short story and all it is is Charlie going to get his GCSE results that's all I need it could be like okay. a one pager I'll do that for you I'll write that for thank you, you. <laughs> I'm ge- I, 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 as an academic I am genuinely stressed for it 
you know what? I because I'm a really academic person as well, and it was really weird to write a character who. I mean, he is stressed about his exams, but I mean, they're the least of his worries, frankly. Like he has so much else going on. Whereas for me, when I was doing my GCSEs, there was literally nothing more important. Like oh, that yeah. was it. I've always needed to do well at school, and like that was a, a huge focus. So it's actually quite refreshing to write a character who. Yeah, I mean, he's worried about it a bit, but he's more worried about his parents' reaction if he does badly than his actual future, because he kind of figures he doesn't have one. Yeah. So he's still kind of getting, and in 12 Bones, he's very much kind of getting used to the idea of like, okay, hold on, what do I do with this future? What do I do with what I can do? And so that, is, you know, he he's thinking about that. That's part of his character. It, 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 honestly, like, I remember doing my GCSEs all those many, many moons ago. I was ritualistic. My dining room was my study hall. I listened. I, I had to have background noise. I literally had a VHS copy of Broken Arrow, Broken Arrow, the Christian Slater, John Travolta, epic movie, and watched it on repeat. And it's not a great movie, but the only reason I watched it on repeat was because I knew it so well. It just blurred in the background, and I ate beetroot, pickled onion, chia butter, bread, and Lucas Aid. All that thought that was my diet. That was, it. That was your life. Because I was, I think I must have just thought if I change this routine in any way, I'm going to fail. And I left with 13 GCSEs, all grade C and above. Thank you very much. So, well done. I thank you. I had to, I had to keep it ritualistic because my my brain otherwise couldn't compute. So Charlie going off and saving the world and having to do the stress of his GCSEs honestly had me on edge and. Is it, well, one of my favourite bits is when it's like towards the end and he's essentially being kidnapped and he just has this ridiculous thought. He's like, I've got an exam in the morning. I, I was worried for him. I thought he could have turned to exam. exam I hope morning. it's a multiple choice geography exam because you're going to be Yeah, tired. I know. And, it, and it's like, and he's kind of like, yeah, I'm not making that, am I? I'm not going to get to that exam. No matter how this turns out, I'm not getting to that exam. And I think, yeah, that was weird. That was stressful for me writing it. I was um, kind of glad are... he got hospitalised because at least then, you know, he had a legitimate yeah, doctor's like a note. legitimate reason to be like, why <laughs> fell geography, even though it was more than Sorry, choice. gas explosion, I have a doctor's note. Explosion, I have a doctor's note. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that was, but I mean, I was just trying to like balance what a teenager would actually be worried about as well. And he would, he'd be worried about his GCSEs because they're so built up. It is yeah. so built up when you're doing your GCSEs. It's and little do you know, it's me. only the first of many exams in your life if you go down the academic route. At least when you get further on in the academic circles, you can avoid the courses that say exam and just go for the ones that say assignment. Or Unfortunately, I went to Oxford and they don't do very many assignments. It's mostly exam. Whoa. Even in humanities. So you do have to do a dissertation and you might be able to wrangle a course or two that has like some like uh, assignments instead of exams but um yeah i had to mostly do exams yeah i don't know why i did that to myself but... i don't understand i did english but i uh literature and american studies and i don't understand how you can do an exam on a book like still yeah like... i did yeah i had to do gobbit exams which is more like history style which i loved i loved the gobbits it's great it's like little bite-sized chunks you get a source image or a source text and you have to write something about it. i'm like this is amazing i had great fun and then yeah essay question exams to get through do three eight three essays in two hours or something oh. no 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 dog no disgusting yes yeah, right okay how could we be stressed about that it's okay, I will answer. Now I know what answers you need, I can write you some sorts of some short stories to tidy up the loose ends. Because there will still be loose ends. It's a very big world, but I try and answer as many questions as I can. Thank you. <laughs> I just see the FAQs on your website. Does Charlie pass his GCSEs? Well, so. <laughs> some of them. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you and... for having me. Thank, thank you, you in the future. Craziness. Yes, <laughs> and thank you in the future for coming back and joining <laughs> us again because we know it's going to happen. Of course, I will always come back. Okay, good. Because you're part of the fictional hangover family now, whether you like it or not. Oh. Yay. <gasps> so that's it for this bonus episode of Fictional Hangover. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. 
Join us next time as we discuss Anna Dressed in Blood by and with Kendara Blake. Look out for our Would You Rather polls on social media. Don't forget about our book club and monthly challenges on Facebook. Be sure to visit our shop on Redbubble at fictionalhangover.redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover-themed merchandise. And become a patron of ours on Patreon at patreon.com slash fictionalhangover. Until next time, remember, the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. You can find us at fictionalhangover.com. Follow us on Instagram, threads, TikTok and YouTube at Fictional Hangover. And find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fictional hangover. If you like this episode, check out our others and be sure to rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss out. And finally, special thanks to Liz Emerson for our music. You can find her on Facebook and Patreon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>